I think pe people are often surprised um, when, when, when you start the tour. When, when people say things, something's handmade, they probably think, oh, it's just finished by hand. Actually, this is actually handmade. You know, it spends a lot of time, actually, in, in craftsmen's hands, which, you know, you just don't get in the ceramic industry that often anymore. I think it's the fact that it's not really, to my mind, it's not really a factory. Yes, we produce everything, we've got all our different departments, but nothing's closed off. Um, and I think that's a real edge for us. It really boosts how we produce bespoke work because we're all so keen. The traditional values of Royal Crown Derby is such that we have highly skilled craftsmen that are using skills that have not changed over the last 260 years. We sort of, it probably sounds a bit emotional, but we actually really care. We care about the product here really want it to work. Porcelain was first manufactured in Derby in around 1750 and the Derby factory always aimed at the very high end of the market. Queen Charlotte is known to have visited the London showrooms and to have made purchases there. Royal patronage was very important in the 18th century. King George III recognised the company by granting his royal warrant in 1775. So from around this date, all Derby porcelain has been marked with a crown on the base. And it's also thought around this time, plain old Derby porcelain became known as Crown Derby porcelain. And in 1890, it was Queen Victoria who granted her royal warrant and the royal name in the title. So from 1890 onwards, we've had the unique title of Royal Crown Derby. So here at Royal Crown Derby, we're really passionate about the, the, the quality of the bone china that we produce. Um, and, and, and we're so passionate about the quality that we actually um, do all the main production processes on site here at Derby. Um, from the preparation of the raw material bodies that we make the slip from, right through to the design process. We could be doing something quite unique for um, VIPs, dignitaries or even royalty on a global basis. Uh, we're steeped in history, we've been around since 1750 and the uh, product range that we have now is a, a mixture of, of traditional, classic and contemporary. So in order to be able to um, have that quality we need to be in control of all those processes. Um, it's not just a case where one person will just make a piece and then hand it over we're all involved, we all want it to work. So there's a real pride in the company and I just don't know anywhere that has that anymore. So like I said, we, we do everything on site. We, we make our own moulds on site. The moulds are made out of Plaster Paris. Um, the casting process involves um, filling the mould with liquid slip. The Plaster Paris absorbs the water out of the slip and creates a skin. After a certain amount of time of casting, the excess slip is then poured out and then the product is left to dry out for at least 24 hours. When it gets to a certain uh, dryness, then you can apply the handles and spouts. The spout, the handle, which are in the moulds. Josh, I'll quickly show you. Same sort of thing, you fill the mould and tip the surplus out. Mm -hmm. This is to make it fit onto the body. I started when I was 15. Came from school and uh, been taught how to do this by the old potters. And uh, now I'm the old guy teaching the, the others. Then you just apply it to where there's the hole is. Fit it up, the seam down the middle, and you just wipe the access off. There's slight marks there so you can see roughly just where to put it. And if you don't put the handle in the right position, when they put the, the, the transfers on, uh, they won't fit. So it's got to be spot on. You line up round the outside. 
and white ground. This, this just extra seals it up. So when you've uh, when you've finished it off, it's tidy. It's tidied up and make it just right for the kilns. And there you have it. Like I say I've been here 43 years uh, to learn how to make the, these and all the items that we've got because uh, the range is so vast that we've got the amount of different things we've made over the years for royalty and everything. So there is a, it's a big range that Crown Dog has got. To make the thing, the, the thing for me is that it's a finished article. I've actually made it and it goes on to the next process so I have to make it better for the next process. And when you see it in the shops for sale, then it's nice to think you have made it and it's been made in Britain. Yeah, everything about uh, Crown Derby is that, hey, I've been here such a long time, you've become part of the furniture. So, that's it. We then take it to the next stage, which we call the fettling, which is where we take the seams of the product and get it ready for the firing process. We're all craftsmen, I think, really. At the end of the day, you know, we learned a skill and uh, <laughs> carry it on. <laughs> and they were using um, knives, scrapers, um, and various other equipment like sponges and, and sponges on sticks to get into all the uh, all the crevices. Of course, before we fire it, it's already had two selection processes before then, and at that stage before firing. If any of the product doesn't meet our um, exacting standards, it can be put back into slip house and recycled and made back into slip to be used um, for on the next batch. The biscuit firing process is um, the first firing process um, and during that one the, the product shrinks by 12%, um, which is uh, quite unique to Bone China. Um, and obviously because of the shrinkage rate, we have to use um, props and setters within the kiln in order to keep the product in shape during that firing process. Now we've got a piece which is actually quite hard. If you put the plate up to the light, you can, you can see your fingers through it, which is the, uh, the transparency and the quality of the bone china body. Um, after the biscuit firing, we select it again before we send it to the next process. Um, and that's called glazing. So that's where we're applying liquid um, glass, basically, onto the piece. Um, and then firing it again, this time slightly lower temperature, about 1120 degrees and for about 14 hours. After the gloss firing, we select it again um, and at that stage it then goes into what we call the gloss warehouse, which is the blanks, which will be ready to then send to the decorating department. We have to add a, a, a pink dye to the glaze, so when the operators are, are, are spraying they can see that the piece has been completely covered um, uh, correctly and then also every, um, every half an hour they'll stop the machine and they'll scrape the glaze back and check the thickness of the glaze to make sure it's absolutely perfect because again we need to be in control of the quality aspect because the glaze thickness does make a difference when we go into the decorated department. So we have our own printing department where we produce our own lithographs and of course the, the, the layouts for the lithographs are generated from our own in-house design department. Some of them are trained in the house, some of them um, have, have trained at the Royal College of um, Art in London. Um, so, uh, but they've all been in the ceramic industry for kind of like the last decade at least. When I first started here, I, I, yeah, you know, I've come to the factory about 18 years ago and I have a factory tour. The first thing I thought was very old fashioned and dated factory and, uh, and everywhere I go I, my eyes just started to glitter all these little gems sparkling. I don't know why but it, it just hit me. I thought what a wonderful product it, it is. And the, 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 the way about our China is, is it's got a, a, amazing ink glaze colours with how, how you describe it in English colours, almost like a stained glass window that you're looking through and when the light hit it, it shied and glow and the transparency of the products. Actually, it's a wonderful uh, feeling. I, I love using colours and Matisse in my, you know, but I look at him as uh, the way he look at colours, how his textiles work 
how he's uh, cooked out, um, paper cut, um, collage, and I, I think all that, they all derive from nature and what's surrounding us. And I, I think um, it's, it's wonderful to, to be able to look at it and put something down and make it work. So Imari, I don't know whether you heard the term Imari because they come from Japan. It's a, a, a stylized form of flowers and they, you know, they, they, they're very simple form of flowers. If you look at it, you probably would recognize it, what it is. In the 19th century, when, when tea had been imported from the Far East, they import these paper print um, and Imari ware come into, the, come into Europe. And, uh, and the, the European fascinated by the, the Imari and the Japanese way of looking at art and uh, that, that's, how, that, that's how it started, and we're imitating what, what, what the Japanese does. And, uh, you know, talking about art, the Impressionists did that the same way. And uh, Art Nouveau derived from it as well. It, it, it's shy through because they can't produce uh, products like we have here the same way over in Japan. All the departments are here that produce the product, um, know all the craftsmen and women, um, we've all got a really good working relationships, so we'll go that extra mile for each other. If someone has a real spark of an idea, we'll work for that and try and create something extra special. Um, which just makes it almost like a family to work with. I don't know anywhere else where people hand paint as part of their job. I just don't know anybody that does that. Not many um, companies, I don't think. A designer can actually take something through from that initial spark and watch it progress and work it through to its full potential and just keep exploring it. That's something else I think is really special. You know, if it's fired in the morning or evening, you get a different firing. So all these things are part of the development process. So I think we maximise a good design when we get a really good one as well. I love to get down to just a little tiny fine Indian paintbrush with about four hairs in it. You train it with ink, but then you can you know, scan that into a computer and, you know, it's limitless. It's, it, you know, your mind boggles what you can do. But I do love to work in the um, sort of clay department, building things up that way. But I've just started to do that. It's sort of new area I want to explore because I love the 3D as well. I work on giftware and tablewares and everything really from, from a, a small gift item um, go up to uh, a, s a special vase, 150,000 pounds vase. <laughs> a computer is brilliant, it's a way forward, but I like my papers <laughs> and I've, um, I do a lot of sketching. I like to do a lot of ideas, I want to produce the best. Um, and I like to say something nice and I want to buy something nice. And when I'm creating some design, I want to create something that people would be happy with and cherish for life. I work with watercolours and uh, inspiration has come from everywhere. I mean, every, I mean, I go out for a walk sometime and look at the plant, look at the flowers, and sometimes it's the natural colours that actually, uh, that, that's why my inspiration. I love mark making and colours. I mean, this is one of my um, new creation, Bristol Bell. And it's very simple, bold, but rich. <laughs> so that's how I, I, I describe it. And I think to drink out of uh, something like that is absolutely wonderful. My inspiration as a designer, it's sort of two motivations. One is to sort of translate the tradition and craftsmanship that's Crown Derby's history and the other is I really love to try and communicate an emotion, invoke a sort of a feeling in somebody so if they pick something up and it, it has the right effect on them I, I just can't think of a better job than that. Um, it's correspondence, I've just got through to the correspondence between Stony and Co Stonia and Co of Liverpool and Royal Crown Derby Stoney and Co were used as agents for the White Star Line for the furnishing of the 
Titanic and her sister ship, the Olympic. So what we've got in here is um, a number of cors correspondence letters um, and they detail the leading up to the order. There we go, this is the original letter that came with the order regarding White Star Steamers, Olympic and Titanic. And when we turn it over, there you can see the, the original quantities that were ordered. So actually quite small, 600 dinner plates, only 100 salad plates and 100 teacups and saucers. This is because the china was used for the most exclusive restaurant on board the ship. This was the a la carte dining room and it could only be used by the first class passengers. So this is the Royal Crown Derby archive. Um, probably the most important bit is the, the pattern archive. We've got 25 books bound in this way, containing over 11,000 different patterns. So I, I'm going to show you the pattern that was used on the Titanic. Royal Crown Derby is one of the few companies to survive today that contributed to the furnishing. The designers certainly come and use these books, yes. Um, possibly the oldest pattern is Derby Japan. Um, Blue Mikado is in these books as well. Pattern books are, they're all pencil and watercolour um, on linen-backed paper and each pattern is, named, is numbered consecutively. And they all give information that is relevant for production such as collars, um, notes about the gilding. <laughs> yeah, this is the one, the pattern that was chosen for the Titanic for the first class a la carte restaurant on board the ship. And you can see there the order actually was confirmed, taken off the market February the 1st, 1911. Um, also, history-wise, my mother, she worked here a long time ago. She was a hand painter. And she trained here, so as a child growing up, I'd watch her hand painting, doodling almost with a pen while she's on the phone or something. And I was like, you know, so curious. So to, to come here and actually get involved with the history and know exactly what it is she was doing, that's quite um, fascinating. I'm always looking for a piece that she painted. We have a beautiful woman china here, and we, we have a lot of um, how you call it? F important clients, and they bought our products, um, you know, for their wedding, for their gift, and it's nice to see and know that what we design, what I design, that go to those people as well. So, and that's a very, very nice thought. And people who bought my products, I think, or our products in a way, that as a company point of view. Uh, uh, um, they, 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 they look at the treasure and they come back for more sometimes. So that, 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 that's the, the most important thing to me. Obviously due, due to the craftsmanship within our company, um, the length of service for all the employees is quite long. Um, the minimum training period required is at least three years, um, or like apprenticeship, um, before they go into the, um, into the production process. The main cost on the business is, is our highly trained cross, across people. Um, after that, the next biggest expense is, is gold. Um, our product is very rich and we use the best quality gold that we can find, which is uh, 22 carat, which we'll see during the production process, which we use over in the printing department. And then also we apply gold by hand in the gilding department. The decorating process is, is, is where we take um, the lithographs which we've printed in-house um, and, and basically what we do is we, we, uh, we soak the lithographs into warm water um, and the print slides off the backing paper and then the lithographers will then will take that and skillfully apply um, the lithograph onto the glossed blank piece. Um, um, you've got to place it on, you've got to do it right. As like a footballer bear, you've got lots of different pieces to put it on. Put on. And you've either got it or you haven't. It, well, it's a skill that you have to train for. Anybody can do it, but the detail we have in the work, 
I, I like the detail we have in the work. Um, it's different from anybody else's. So just wet it. Which piece goes on first? Because if you put the body on, you might go to put the head on and then you'd nudge the body off. So there's a way of putting things on all the time. Gently, putting the eyes on the moulding. This is called a squeegee and this just gets the water out. The stomach on. Onto the shoulders, so it's got to fit in between the arms. Try and keep your eyes as straight as you can, but it's got a bit of a belly, so it does bow out. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad one to do, actually. The lift graphing process can be very complicated. Um, if you can imagine, you know, it's, it's quite difficult putting, just trying to lift a graph of a flat plate, but then you've also got to bear in mind that um, some of these pieces that cost many, many thousands of pounds um, are on 3D shapes, complex curves, um, so it takes a great deal of skill um, in order to, uh, to get those products made to this standard that we do. It's all in the detail as well, the little details at the front. The lithographs are, are, are fired on first, um, then it's checked again, um, and then we go to the gilding section where they're then applying the gold by um, brush, uh, which is a very skilled, skilled operation. So you need very steady hands to work in this uh, section. And of course, that's 22 karat gold that uh, Emma's applying there by brush. The brown colour of the gold that we use, it's the, um, the liquids and the oils that make it pliable for actually us to use it as a, as a, as a, almost as a paint, if you like, so that we can, we can brush it onto the, uh, to whatever piece that we're doing. It's the artistic side of things, it's the concentration that you have to put into whatever piece that you're doing, the constant new pieces, you're learning something new uh, every single day really, um, and just, just, just everything about it, it's just it's a fantastic job to do and you know if I didn't love it so much I, I wouldn't have done it for as long as I have done and I'd be here for another 17 years hopefully you know it's, it's the individuality of each piece you'll never get too identical even if you're doing something that's part of a set it's still got its, its own individualness to it um, and it, you know it's, it's something that a machine or anything like that can't can't do so this is the uh, this is the hand hand painted department. So this is where, we're, um, instead of lose, using lithograph um, decals, we're actually 100% hand painting onto the pieces. And what we'll do is we'll we'll layer the colours up. So um, the, you know you, you can't paint something like that in one go. You have to put the first coat down and fire it, and then just keep building it up. And an item like this might take three or four firings before we've got the vibrancy of colour that we're looking for. And of course, these are very, very, very highly skilled. Um, ladies, how long, is it, how long does it take you to, to, to paint some of these in hours terms? 40, 50 hours to, 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 to hand paint that. So many flowers on this. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of detail and all the taking out. Yeah. There's a lot of work that goes into this. Um, and um, it takes time for each stage, doesn't it? Yeah. And, um, and every one of us are different, no one yeah. will be exactly the same. No. Mm -hmm. Even if you try to make them exactly we're the just, same, they'll, they'll be slightly unique. We're just the finished piece, we can create it. There's a lot of that goes in. Every single, single operator marks their wear with their own letter, so from a, a quality point of view, we can check who lithographed the piece and who gilded the piece on every single piece we produce. The second to last stage of production is what we call burnishing. Um, there's mediums uh, and carriers that we put in the gold to allow us to print and to allow us to, 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 to use a brush and to brush it on. Um, and as, as they are fired, it makes the gold go matte. So the burnishing process is we're basically polishing the gold back up um, and, and basically flattening the gold particles back down again, which then brings out the, the full beauty of the 22 karat gold. Okay, so this is the punishing department. So this is getting close to the end of the process. So the mediums that are in the, the printing gold and the, um, and the brushing golds that we use, 
uh, when fired, make, make the gold matte. So basically, this department is 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 polishing the the gold back up, um, which which brings out its uh, its true shine and its uh, quality. Yeah, you just uh, feel really uh, proud because it's for royal families as well, and um, it's really unique, and it's really people's skills going around. And when you look at a finished piece, and you're thinking, wow. Oh, Amazing how good is it? How many people are involved in this just one piece? Yeah. And um, you feel, oh, it's really good. Yeah. Then you feel like to spend some money as well, you see, because it is some people's hand skills, so you pay for it. After the burnishing, we then go to final selection, um, and that's the check to make sure the product is. Um, to our exacting quality standards before it goes to the warehouse for uh, shipment around the world. The most important thing is take it away from the environment I work with and to say it, and to say it at home, see whether it's work, because the lighting at home is completely different and the sparkle at night times, uh, when I'm using it, um, it's glow and it's come to life and that, that how Crown Derby is about. Um, it's from the Georgian times. Uh, we, we have really expensive tea set, and they, most of it are hand painted beautifully with gold uh, leaf. Yeah. And when the customer take it home, they dine it in candlelight. The lights started to sparkle and hit in the gold, and the layer of color started to come through and is smiling and laughing at them in a way and it, 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 that's how it, how I see it in a way and I want now China to be like that to be used in candlelight at home or in a really you know, warm lighting and it's, it's a wonderful experience.